In 1966, the North Korean men's soccer team qualified for the World Cup, defeated Italy 1-0, then held a 3-0 lead over Portugal in the quarterfinals. They would end up losing in heartbreaking fashion. Were the players made national heroes for what they did? No, allegedly they were sent to a labor camp. In 2010, after a 40-year absence, they qualified for the World Cup again, but gave up 12 goals in three games while scoring one. What do you think happened to them? From 2016 to 2018, the team employed a German-Norwegian named Jorn Andersen as their coach and had limited, if not no, success. What do you think happened to him? It's time to take a deep dive into the most secretive, mysterious, and outright interesting international football team on Earth. One that clearly demands a lot and has the power to punish failure severely. This is the story of the most dangerous game. North Korean soccer. Look, times are about to change and it's more important than ever to make smart budgetary decisions in every aspect of your life. Eating good and healthy doesn't have to be expensive. HelloFresh is a meal delivery service that saves you time, money, and gas, all while tasting great and being good for you. Guess what, HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining out and grocery shopping. The right portioned ingredients reduce wasted food and they have over 30 dinner recipes to choose from every week. Check out this delicious Southwest beef cavatappi I made. Easy to cook and I even had leftovers. Whatever your dietary needs, HelloFresh has you covered. Veggie, pescatarian, fit and wholesome, it's all here to help you meet your goals. Are you ready to start saving money and eating better? If so, head on over to HelloFresh.com and use code 5.16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Again, go to HelloFresh.com from the link below and use code 5.16 and get 16 free meals and three free gifts across six HelloFresh boxes. Eat good, save money. HelloFresh. In order to understand North Korea's soccer team, we first need to understand North Korea. After the Japanese ceded their occupation following their surrender in World War II, Korea was split in two, much like East and West Germany. A line was drawn and two nations formed. The commies to the north, the freedom to the south. In 1950, a former guerrilla fighter named Kim Il-sung founded the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and led a Soviet-backed invasion of South Korea. A conflict raged for three years and millions died, and there has never been an official peace, just a military stalemate and an armistice that resulted in the creation of a demilitarized zone that separates the North and South. Once the dust settled, Kim Il-sung stressed self-reliance and vowed to make his nation completely independent from the world. He did this through complete authoritative power, absolute isolation from the world, and a draconian control of the media. And though shrouded in secrecy, the nation developed a love of soccer and competing on the international playing field, something that very much opposed how the nation viewed the world. But like being a single man, I guess playing with themselves got boring after a while. The most dangerous game had begun. The North Korean soccer team was actually founded in 1945, shortly after World War II, and they were officially affiliated with FIFA in 1958. The North Koreans burst onto the scene when they qualified for the FIFA World Cup in England in 1966. Most of the team and its officials had never been outside of the country, but they actually won a playoff and became the first Asian team in history to make it past the first round doing so thanks to a 1-0 upset of Italy. Upset might not be a strong enough word. It was close to a miracle. The Italians were left crying in their locker room following the loss. The North Korean team became celebrities in England, the feel-good underdogs who just so happened to come from a dictatorship that doesn't allow its citizens to leave. That wasn't the player's fault. In the quarterfinal, North Korea held a 3-0 lead against Portugal, but collapsed in epic fashion and allowed five unanswered goals, ending their unexpected run. A little more on this later. There was a downside to all this fanfare. North Korea wasn't exactly welcomed with open arms just a few years after starting the Korean War and being openly communist and not giving a damn about human rights. First of all, England didn't even recognize the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, instead calling them North Korea as most of us know them today. The host nation didn't want to play their national anthem, so they decided not to play anyone's national anthem save for the opening game and the final round. 
Had North Korea made it to the finals, it might have made for a diplomatic incident, but Portugal's furious comeback spared everyone all that awkwardness. Kim Il-sung was deeply invested in his team's performance, urging them to win a couple matches to bring honor to the people. And using their ultra-disciplined and coordinated style of play, they delivered. You would think he would have been happy with what they accomplished. Instead, their collapse against Portugal was blamed on a rumor that the team had been drinking and partying with women in the days before the game. And thus, they were allegedly punished upon their return. No one knows for sure what happened to that 1966 team, but it's widely speculated that most of them were sent to North Korean gulags, where they were put in sweat boxes and forced to do hard labor. One former player who defected recalled having to eat cockroaches in order to survive in a camp. In 2002, a documentarian was permitted to enter the country where he interviewed surviving players from the 1966 team. North Korean officials said a few of the members of the team were simply dead. Okay. Glorious leader Kim Il-sung led North Korea for another 28 years after the 66 World Cup until his death in 1994. And they would never make another World Cup in his lifetime. I wonder why, given the reward was probably not worth the effort. With the old guy out of the way, we can introduce North Korea's new, even more over-the-top leader. Kim Jong-il. After a brief three-year period of national mourning, Kim Jong-il officially took over a country that was in shambles. He also found the time to shoot a minus 38 and 18 holes of golf, the first time he ever played. The collapse of the Soviet Union left them without foreign aid, and North Korea was quickly becoming a hellscape. Citizens suffered through a famine that lasted four years, but also because a massive flood damaged their crops and infrastructure. This rough time coincided with the shutdown of the team, but it didn't stop them from meddling in sports. In 1987, North Korea was believed by South Korean intelligence to be behind the Korean Air 858 bombing that killed all 115 on board. The spy who planted the explosives was captured and explained that the bombing was meant to discourage international teams from attending the 88 Summer Olympics in Seoul. In 2002, the World Cup was held in both South Korea and Japan. Obviously, the South Korea part was going to piss off North Korea. The team didn't qualify for the World Cup. In fact, they didn't enter at all, but one of FIFA's priorities, according to a high-ranking official, was to be engaged in helping North Korean football, aka soccer. Maybe not being able to have a chance to show which Korea was superior on the pitch lit a fire underneath the North Koreans as they reinvigorated their program and made a push to qualify for the 2010 World Cup in Brazil, which they did. In their first match against heavily favored host nation Brazil, the North Koreans actually gave a hell of an effort, but were bested two to one. That was all the fight they had in them, unfortunately, and in their next game, they were trounced 7-0 by the Portuguese, followed by a 3-0 loss to Ivory Coast. There were, in fact, a small number of North Korean fans present at their games. But with everything North Korean, that's all depending on what you choose to believe. There were reports that those fans were actually paid actors from China, not North Korea. Kim Jong-il was pretty adamant that his citizens not travel outside the country, probably because they wouldn't come back, especially after they saw a carnival in Rio. While in Brazil, the team was followed by country officials and not allowed to speak to outsiders. Every one of their movements was tracked. In North Korea, if someone defects, they often punish that person's entire family and sometimes subsequent generations. Needless to say, everyone made it back on the plane. So you're probably wondering what happened to the players and the coaches. There was speculation that they would be sent to coal mines, but luckily it seems like the worst they had to endure was a little bit of public shaming. That lasted six hours. The team, as well as coach Kim Jong-hun, not Kim Jong-un, were made to stand on a stage in front of 400 onlookers and take some serious berating from other North Korean athletes and officials. Basically the same thing that the Falcons have endured since 28-3 happened. Finally, the team was forced to criticize Coach Kim. According to the rumors, Kim was expelled from North Korea, which sounds awesome. Or more likely, he was sent to work at a construction camp in Pyongyang. Not as fun. Kim's failure wasn't seen as a disappointment, it was seen as a betrayal. 
It might be fun to joke about your coach who sucks, but remember, those are just jokes. At the end of the day, he goes back to his mansion and eats pizza. In North Korea, that dude eats cockroaches for the rest of his life. Not long after the failure in the 2010 World Cup, Kim Jong-il was so embarrassed by his team's performance that he died. Enter this guy, Kim Jong-un, the dictator who gets his fades done at the North Korean version of Supercuts. He's a big sports guy, as evidenced by his love for Jordan's Bulls and his guest of honor, Dennis Rodman. Apparently, he also loves this channel. Kim Jong-un is a believer that sports play a big role in consolidating a nation's prestige and honor and decided to invest heavily in athletics especially soccer. He claims that when he was studying in Switzerland, he would travel to the San Siro and watch AC Milan. Kim Jong-un views sports no differently than warfare. He once wrote that sports people should regard their training programs as combat orders given by the party and their training arena as a battlefield for implementing the party's ideas and defending their country. That's terrifying, but you got to admit that's real as fuck, and it also explains the punishment after losing. In 2016, the North Koreans went outside the box, doing something even insane for them, hiring Norwegian-German-born Jorn Andersen as their coach. Andersen was criticized for taking the job, and in North Korea, he was given lofty expectations. Their goal was winning the 2019 Asian Cup. That didn't happen, but it wasn't necessarily Anderson's fault. Economic sanctions in the wake of nuclear testing in North Korea left them unable to compete financially. Anderson left or was allowed to leave due to the dire financial situation, but he never regretted his time in North Korea. In fact, he actually liked it, especially the player's mentality. He enjoyed the fact that the players did what he told them without a second thought. I mean, there has to be some positives to having a ruthless dictatorship. So disciplined players and no riots must be two of them. Ultimately, Anderson was likely another tool for North Korea. They surprisingly treated him extremely well, and in return, Anderson had nothing but good things to say about his time there. And they probably handed him an envelope with pictures of his family and told him don't dare say a bad thing about us. Probably the most amazing thing the North Koreans do is how they depict soccer to their own people. Though we know what happened, Kim Jong-un commissioned paintings of North Korean victories at the Olympics and the World Cup. I mean, it's not like his people can Google that shit anyways. According to these paintings, North Korea won the World Cup finals when they made it in 1966 and in 2010. They don't allow advertisements in public spaces. Sounds nice, actually. But there is plenty of deceitful propaganda depicting national achievements that clearly never happened. It's just one way the North Korean government has brainwashed its people into submission. Kim Jong-un has created an image of North Korean glory, and he's used soccer to do it. Sports are universal, but they're not supposed to be a game of life and death. Unless you ask Steelers fans.